Welcome to Reading and Writing Between the Lines, a podcast series about communication skills in the workplace. I'm your host, John Witzman. Join me as I speak with industry professionals and Conestoga faculty and alumni to explore their journeys with reading and writing skills. Follow us as we talk about how communications learning has changed over the years, how these skills are used in a wide range of industries, and the future of workplace communications. And hello, welcome to another edition of Reading and Writing Between the Lines. I'm here today with Sarah Zabazuski, Clinical Educator of OR and PACU at Grand River Hospital. Did I get that right, Sarah? Yes, Excellent. You did. Thank you so much for being here today with me. Can we start by getting a little bit of insight into to what you do in your role as Clinical Educator of OR and PACU at Grand River? So I am an experienced operating room nurse. So what I do at my job is either uh, mentor or help with um, new learning within the OR and PACU. So any new equipment, any new changes to practice, especially in nursing practice or nursing standards, I have to follow up with that with the staff members and create policies that they have to fo- follow and guidelines that make the actual decisions for certain types of procedures and stuff like that. Fascinating. There's so much there that I think will be interesting for our conversation today in terms of education and learning and how you uh, communicate that learning experience with the people that you work with. Uh, before we dive into all of the things that you do in your in your role now, I, I'm going to ask you to travel back in time with me a little bit to uh, remember what your experiences with Uh, reading and writing in an educational environment were like in your early days. Was that a positive, rewarding experience for you? Was that something that you found to be unpleasant? What was that like in the early days? So I love reading. I am 100% a bookworm. I read everything and anything, even now. I hate writing. Essays, papers, they are the worst. Like, I dread them. And when I even, like, had to do a stats paper, yeah. I cried because I did not want to write it. And it was worth 50% of my mark. It made me feel so upset or disappointed in myself if yeah. I didn't get my mark. But I could read a textbook. I could read it front to back, know exactly what I'm talking about, present what I'm talking about, understand what I'm talking about. But putting that on an actual essay to show how I learn it, I... I am a, it was so disappointing for me with all my marks. Well, first of all, thank you very much for sharing that with me because I, I know that there can be some feelings around uh, writing and then even just the feelings around the feelings. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for, for, uh, for your uh, uh, openness there. And also because I know that there are people who might be listening to this and feel the same way that the, the, the tyranny of the blank page and the blinking cursor is powerful and um, really, really scary for a lot of people. Well, in the nursing um, schooling and everything, that, that um, essay and stuff like that can be brought off of a lot of marks. So right. you're not actually showing how you really are a nurse. Right. So we talk about book smart nurse and street smart nurse. Oh, interesting. Who can do what? And you can see that, especially with new grads and even within my job now, like who is who knows the book off by heart and can work it, or who can actually do the job right. without learning from the book, learning from experience and learning from that. So I definitely want to dive into this <laughs> dichotomy between book smart and street smart because I think it's fascinating and so, so relevant to our conversation. Um, but but first, I'm curious to know um, what you did when you had those writing assignments in school. Uh, was, was your instinct to... to put the writing off until the last minute and then write the assignment in a kind of last night flurry of energy? Or did you did you just have a sort of painful experience of attacking it piece by piece, but you were still on top of it? What did that look like for you? Um, usually if I get a writing assignment and I still do, do this to this day, I actually start on it right away. I don't wait. I get into it because Good for you. I overwrite a little bit. And then I always get someone to check my writing because it might make sense to me. It might not make sense to them or it might, I don't know, I might write something completely weird and make a huge spelling mistake. Sure. So I usually have all my papers done at least a week beforehand, just, co- just cause I am so anxious to hand it in. 
And the last time I actually did that, I was actually really proud of it. It was all about um, actually intercommunication um, and ethics. I was so happy I got like a 95% on it. I literally was crying the entire time reading it. Congratulations. I didn't expect that we would get into into so many tears so early in the conversation, but I'm 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 glad that we have cuz you know, we can there's there's only joy from from here on out. Uh, but no, it's it's uh it, it's true that that these are high stakes experiences for a lot of us, right? When we are being asked to communicate our feelings or what we've learned, there's a lot of there's a lot riding on it because we, in some cases, know that we know it and and we, we know that we're being judged on how well we know it. And the extent to which we can actually follow through and communicate that is it feels feels high stakes, right? Because we know we've got it and we want to, to share that with the world. Uh, w- this process sounds amazing, by the way, and uh, is, is so sort of exemplary. Was that always how you approached your, uh, your writing? Did, did that kind of come naturally to you? Did you develop that over time? Do you have a recollection of how that progressed? Um, actually, it developed over time uh, since high school, just because I knew that if I didn't do it right away, I would procrastinate and then I would be up all night. And I didn't really like that. And I didn't want to continue that into right. college just because it would affect my learning as well. Yeah. And then it affected even um, continuing on with my other uh, going back to university at the same time. Well, let's let's take the conversation there. Speaking of, of college, uh, you uh, are uh, an alumni of Conestoga College, uh, having taken the uh, at first the pre-health science program and then the practical nursing program. Uh, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, and so uh, I'm very curious to know w- what that experience was like for you when you were sort of taking significant steps towards a career in in health sciences and nursing, um, but you've got a writing course or two on your timetable, uh, that, that anxiety was, was there still in post-secondary around the writing and around the grades and around, you know, your ability to, to, to communicate what you learned that was still there? Oh, a hundred percent, especially if any essays or papers that you had to write that were a significant part of your grade. Right. Certain courses that we had in practical nursing, they were to show how we practice, how we actually did the nursing skills. So I excelled at those ones. Right. Certain tests or anything like that were also not too bad as well. Fact but based that, knowledge, yeah. yeah. But anything with like essay writings and stuff like that, I dreaded. And I actually didn't take, uh, I looked at electives that I didn't want to take based off if I had to write essays. If it was more than two essays, Nope, I did not pick wow. it as my elective. Good planning, though. Good foresight. I mean, we'd call that critical thinking. We'd call that critical reading. Yep. I'm I'm curious to know how much of your uh, nursing courses had writing components in them. Was that something that was off to the side in a in a writing course, or was that also part of your? It was also part of the nursing course. Okay. Oh yeah, no. Every, everything to do in nursing also has to deal with writing and communication, actually. So. Every class had one essay. Every class had a huge test. Every class had a practical skill that you had to do. So you had to get easily comfortable with doing that. And it's not easy at all. Like you're scared and right. like trying to write this big paper on this one topic. It's so hard to do that. And then trying to be concise and answer the questions that the, that the professor wants you to answer. Right. And don't know the right answer to it. Talk about being concise. Was that something that you found uh, was a helpful part of your process, having this process developed from from high school days, uh, writing it early, chipping away at it, getting someone else to look at it, having time to, to revise it? Did you notice your writing get sort of tighter and more concise over the course of that cycle? Sometimes. It depends on the subject. If I was really passionate about a subject, like I like surgery, so if I wrote about that... No, I would overwrite completely oh, right, of course. because I want to prove my point to show that I am actually right. <laughs> yes, right. You, th- th- look at me. I've got I've got all this knowledge and, and I'm going to give it all to you. Yep. Yes. You talked earlier about the uh, the, the, the groups, the camps that uh, emerge uh, between the, the book smart uh, people and the, the street smart people. Did you did you notice that already starting to develop at the sort of post-secondary level in the classroom that there were there were some people who 
uh, felt as you did that the, the writing experience was arduous and then there were others who were sort of eager to dive into that kind of experience? Did you, did you no- notice different attitudes or did you feel like everyone was sort of in your camp? Um, you kind of c- could see it in certain people, especially yeah. depending on how they wrote their notes or how they were in class, especially if they participated more or if they didn't. Yeah. Um, but especially in the nursing program, you could really see who read every last word of that yeah. uh um, article that they gave us or who would skim it over and know exactly what they're talking about and can express it as they're talking about it. I have so many questions <laughs> about the reading and about the writing. So one of my uh, hobby horses, so to speak, is around note taking. I feel like note taking is the lost art of the sort of modern student, right? That that the, the phone and the computer have kind of killed the art of making notes on the fly. Oh, no, uh, you you should see my notebook. I get the pens. I get the different color pens, the different color highlighters. I have section markers. Oh, my goodness, no. I still take notes by hand. These are the hallmarks for me of the the true note-taking artist, the the multicolored pen. Uh, and and the highlighter, right, and and then the command over them. You've got them. You've got them between the different fingers, and you can flip between them. Yep. expertly, <laughs> amazing. So you had that at, at the post secondary level, sort of already uh, working pretty well. Oh yeah, um, compared to my notes from high school, to compare to my first group of nursing to my last year of nursing, you could see how I even progressed then to making sure I have um, clear post-it notes that if I want to make notes and attach it to pictures and stuff like that, yeah. it can go right into my textbook. Or um, I can scan an object on my phone and print it out and actually photocopy or, or um, oh, work cool. on it and stuff like that. So that's a nice kind of amalgamation of the, uh, the old school and the new school technology. Uh, I, I want to transition into the workplace in just a second, but my other uh, curiosity from the thing that you said earlier is around how people read uh, textbooks and how people uh, read for meaning when when it's such a dense uh, communication like a textbook. Do you do you remember having uh, strategies for unpacking the textbook, or were you the type to sort of sit down, page one, left, right, top to bottom until you got to the end of the chapter? Oh no, I actually. So what I would do is I would skim through the chapter first to see what topics we would go through. I would look at the pictures because all nursing textbooks have huge pictures and sure. multiple and multiple charts and stuff. And then I would slowly skim through it, and then I would make my notes as I would go. Again, all of my textbooks along the ride along the side, there's yeah. tons of writing and yeah. little notes or little tabs that I would remember or highlighters. And I should have brought a textbook actually to show you. Oh, that would have been cool. Maybe we'll <laughs> we'll get you to send us a picture and we can attach it uh, to the to the to the posting for this yeah. podcast later. Uh, I I think this is, you know, very very much at the heart of what we talk about when we talk about literacy and when we talk about uh, communications in an educational context. Right, it's not just the end product, but very much the 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 uh, the process and these sort of. Uh, connective pieces. So let's let's take uh, all of this and and start to transition into how you use these skills in in your working life. Uh, you you you've, you've gone on a bit of a journey in your in your professional career. Can you maybe um, uh, tell us your uh, trajectory uh, in the the nursing field, and then we'll start to to dive into that. Sure. So. Um I started as a practical nurse, worked several years on an inpatient medical and oncology palliative floor, as well as transition as working as a scrub nurse in the operating room at Grand River Hospital. So I was doing both jobs, and then I went back to school as to do my university, where I completed and got my RN uh, degree with that. And then I became another role within the operating room as the circulator. So they would be um, in charge of the room and all that as well. And then I cl- uh, currently just became educator of the OR. So literally within a year. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So it's a brand new role for me within the year. Um, communication throughout all of it is very, very high, like as well as reading and writing. There's, there's no time or day that you are not either talking to someone, communicating with someone, or reading something throughout any of my career points. It sounds like such a busy day, but also a rich day, um, for lack of a better word, like a um, an engaged day, right? Like it's really 
demanding of your your training and your instincts and your skills in a in a way that sounds kind of invigorating? Oh yeah, for sure. And I can even give it an, like an example. Please. So at the bedside and you're a nurse and you're dealing with a patient that's really sick. You are the first one there. You're the only one there in the last 12 hours. The physician might not be in the hospital. Right. So based on my assessment, I have to effectively communicate that to the doctor, what I'm seeing so he can un- they can understand yeah. what I'm seeing and to give me directions and what I can do to help the patient better. So imagine as a first new year nurse, like you're sweating, you're yeah. like, oh my God, I have to call the doctor. But even oh, even after time calling the doctor several times or in a critical si- situation, it comes easier. Right. Like I can call someone and be like, hey, this is happening. I'm going to do this. Is that are you OK with that? Or, hey, this is happening. You need to get here now. Like right. you, you can communicate that once your skills and your ability gets better and your intuition. But that is a huge thing is the intuition as well as following up with charting, which everyone hates because it's all writing, right? literally all writing and reading, like reading, going home and reading up different surgeries that you see or different diseases that you learn about. Like you still have to do that even though you're done nursing school, right? especially if you're taking care of that patient for several days, like, oh my God, I don't know what this is. So you look up it, you okay. read, read about it, or you even can, um, talk to the doctor. They'll tell you all about it as well. Right. So a lot of that, that ongoing learning is self-directed. It's based on the situation that you find yourself in. And where, where does one look for the up-to-date information on, <laughs> on, on the disease that you might be seeing at your work? Um, <laughs> I mean, I imagine to, that's a skill in and of itself to know where to look. It is. It is. But to be honest, we all go to Google first thing. We yeah. literally just Google it. Yeah. And if it doesn't come up with the name or the thing that we think it is, we go into uh, medical dictionaries okay. um, online, um, certain journal articles we do look up as well. Especially in my role now, if I'm looking up something specific for like the OR or the PACU, like certain outcomes or certain studies, I that's all I do is look up what is effective. And then I have to read all of them to see if they are up, up, be able to be applied to the OR and PACU at the same time. Can you remember a moment when you felt yourself doing that kind of reading and thinking at speed, like kind of um, the, the, the dated pop culture reference that comes to my mind in these situations, these learning situations is the Keanu Reeves matrix. I know Kung Fu moment where there's a kind of empowerment, a kind of awe, a kind of self-realization that, wait a minute, I'm doing this at a pretty high level. Where in, maybe if there wasn't a single moment, but do you, do you remember that feeling of of starting to look around you and say, "Hey, I'm I'm doing this pretty fast." Yeah, actually, um, because some of our we have a, a large group of new nurses within the PACU and OR. I actually was creating a PowerPoint based on rare surgical complications or procedures within the operating room, and so I was going by service like general orthopedics, and I actually created the PowerPoint within a day, like almost 100 slides. And that's just based off my knowledge, not including anything that I've added to the textbooks. Like that's all uh, on another page. But this is stuff that I've experienced or what I've seen. And I was looking at all of it. I was like, oh my gosh, like I've just, this is all off of my head and from what I've done as a nurse. And I was like, wow, that is a lot. And like to be able to do that and remember all the steps within the surgery, I was like, wow. This is this is really good. That's your I know kung fu moment. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> Do you in that moment or in the moments after where you had that kind of feeling of empowerment? Was there any instinct to or impulse to trace a line backwards to you know those papers that you 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 wrote uh, begrudgingly? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially with the surgical site infection ones because that's what I was passionate about. Anything to do with surgery, I was really passionate about. So. I actually did pull up one of my papers oh, that, wow. oh my gosh, I could not believe what, how I found this one article. And I still use that article, even though it's a couple of years older yeah. for my PowerPoint. But I was just like, oh, this is the reason why I got this PowerPoint and sorry, this paper, cause it yeah. was so good. Yeah. It said exactly what I wanted to say with, about f- infections. It said exactly what I wanted to relate to other people saying, Hey, this is a serious matter. Don't kid around about it. And it just went straight to the point. 
with it. So I love it still. That's that's an amazing example. And it's it really resonates, I think, with some of the other conversations we've had where people feel sort of at once uh, there's a sense of uh, progression that feels kind of like it came out of nowhere. And then, and then at the same time, there's the gradual realization that actually it didn't come out of nowhere. It actually came gradually over many, many years of, of practice and, and training. Um, and, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm curious to see where, uh, some of those other lines went, uh, you talked about the, um, the charting, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and I'm and I'm so fascinated to hear more about that. Is that a is that document already sort of formatted for you with like headings and 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 sections where you are, are required to fill in certain information? How blank is that page? How much do you have to come up with on your own? What does that chart look like? So certain charts will actually have things that you that have already been added. So in the operating room, we have segments for different parts of the chart. Some of those chart parts are already filled up because. Nothing changes on the OR. The same procedure of the same doctor happens the exact same way because they don't like to change either. Okay. No one likes to change in the OR. Right. And so certain parts of that can be repopulated for the charting purposes. So when you're going through the chart, you're you're putting inputs that anything pretty much has changed with the patient. Okay. Um, so it's very easy to do. The charting pretty much for the OR doesn't take that long if you actually focus on it and complete it. What is the biggest thing with charting is the inpatient units. Okay. That is longer. You have to put in um, not only all your assessments and everything, but any conversations you had with family or vital sign changes or something that critically that happened to the patient. I have a physician, an anesthesiologist that's there that if something goes wrong, he can help me. Right. He's the first one to do, deal with anything. Same with the surgeon. Upstairs on the floor, they don't have anyone. So they have to write down everything they've seen and done then phone the doctor or f- try to find the doctor right. and deal with all that at the same time. So that is the difficult part of charting. And everyone hates it because it takes so long. Yeah, Like in ICU, when I went there for COVID, my charting purposes took almost an hour just for one set of assessments. Wow. And you chart every four hours, your full body assessment. And every hour on the hour, you chart vitals. Thank goodness, like the computer is smart enough that repopulates them into the chart. But like that takes time. Yeah. Tra- translating this through my sort of communications <laughs> professor lens, it sounds to me a lot like the process of digesting a textbook into uh, notes that are now sort of uh translatable to some kind of purpose, right? Yeah. That, that are they're going to help you to, you know, be successful on the test or they're going to give you the information that you need to write that essay. But that taking that large set of information, you know, and then and then filtering out the essential from the non-essential, get, sort of writing it down in some format that is clear and concise, but also accurate that that's sort of s- similar to what you're dealing with when you're when you're taking in a patient that that they're a live textbook pretty much yeah and that's hard it it's very hard imagine the textbook co- talking back to you right exactly yeah yeah and and maybe and maybe not even being accurate about you know its own experience um another thing that we we sort of use as a, a touchstone in in the teaching and learning of of communications uh, are the the concepts of audience and purpose the sort of rhetorical situation and i'm curious you you mentioned the the the, doc, the communication between between uh, the various uh, members of of a healthcare team um, and, and and it made me think that that there would be a, a lot of audience expectations factoring into how you write do you are you mindful of who's going to be reading this and what they are looking for or what they're sort of what what they don't want to see on on the the charts oh 100 percent. especially so on the charts and everything you can't put your own personal feelings to it so it's 100 percent has to be fact right when I'm sending out an email to all the nurses and all the doctors and stuff like that, I have to be very mindful of what I say and how I portray it because right. they can take it 360 right. with it. And so before I even send an email, I always triple check before pressing that send saying, yeah. is this really what I want to say? And that's 
prior to me, them coming back to me and saying, well, you said this and we right. have it in an email. And oh I'm like, gosh, yes. oh, like it happened even today. Like someone was, I was like, did you read the whole thing? Okay. Cause like sh- they were saying, oh, well you said that we would have this. And I said, I, yes. But did you read the last part saying we will try and help as needed? Right. And it's just where the contact of like, they're looking at where they want their answer and right. not reading the entire thing. Right. Doctors get the same way too, especially yeah. when like, oh, what happened here? And it's like, okay, just read it down the page a little bit more. Right. We go into detail. Or if um, a physician wants to have a history or a consultation, when they read the whole thing, like we, they just want the end notes. They literally want the conclusion notes. They right. don't want to read the whole thing. But if you read the whole thing, you actually get the better picture of it. So, that sounds like a real challenge though, to, to try to manage the... Uh, audience demands or exp- desire for uh, being concise, but also the um, the purpose demands, let's say, of being um, uh, substantial and being accurate and being fact based. That that those can be at odds with each other. Sometimes. Oh my goodness, a hundred percent every day. Yeah, literally. D- do you? And I don't want I don't want you to feel like you have to put anybody <laughs> on blast here. But do you feel like the uh, engagement with the communication part of the job, the preparedness for the communication parts of the job, that that varies throughout the, the hospital team? And and, um, and and do you find that that sort of communication breakdowns uh, cause um, problems? Oh, yeah. definitely. If you don't have a well-communicated team, even on a regular day, things could happen. Things can get missed. Um, we have something called a surgical safety checklist. It's kind of like what uh, pilots do right before they take off. It's a checklist that right. everyone has to go through. Everyone has to participate in that checklist. If we miss one thing, we could be doing surgery on the wrong body part, right. on the wrong patient. So we have to communicate that yeah. saying, this is the right patient. We have to do our checks. We have to do our reading of the actual chart prior to. So we definitely have to make sure that is completely 100% sa- um, safe at this instance before we do anything. And even when communicating with the doctor about certain tests or like, oh, do they want this? Or they like special equipment that they might need? Just for an example, that is something that we need to be prepared for. And if we don't have the equipment, that could be detrimental to someone's health and they cancel the surgery. So that is something that we absolutely have to do. And that's one of the big things in my role now that I have to, hmm, what's the word? I have to maintain status quo with it because you can lose that with the telephone tag or you can lose that in writing or you can lose that as walking down the hallway. So if everyone is aware of what's going on in a situation, then it's better for everyone with it. How do you balance the sort of technical side of the teaching and learning that you do with uh, the, we'll call them soft skills, the communication skills? Do you find that sometimes you're working with people who are younger in their career, um, earlier on in their career, and they maybe don't have yet the experience to appreciate the value and significance of the communication side? Is that something that you have to help people to kind of... Oh, 100%, especially coming into the OR. The OR is not a place where you ha- you can be quiet. You have to speak up and you right. have to communicate with those doctors. You have to communicate with your team every day. It's not a place where you're just going and going on a computer and taking care of a patient. You have to be there and know what's going on and be able to communicate that with the surgeon or the anesthesiologist. Hey, the next patient's not doing so well. Can you go and see them? Or, hey, your patient in PACU is not or is not breathing good. We need to go see them again. Or your orders aren't correct. Or right. how can we fix this for next yeah. time? Like, You can have a million conversations in the OR in one day. So here's this is so there are so many things that (laughs) that uh, I want to to know more about. One of them is, again, coming back to this idea of a book smart type and a street smart type. In your experience, have you found that maybe those uh, roles are, are not as uh, defined and separate as they might seem that the, that the, the book smart person, let's say actually is able to draw on that experience of, of, of communicating and writing in order to, to, to really communicate their ideas in the room, or that maybe the street smart person's, uh, quote unquote, actually has a lot of knowledge and they're able to draw on that. Is, is, is that, 
Do, that, do those roles actually get sort of flattened out when when everybody's actually doing their job? Yes. So usually it comes with the it usually comes with years of experience. You see okay. that really at the beginning of nursing, right. the street smart and the um, book smart. But then after a while, they all merge together. Right. Because it it just takes the time. So like I said, I started as a street smart person as well as a book smart in certain areas. But I've merged. Right. I could be able to do both sides of it and still be able to accomplish what I needed to do with it. And there's a lot that you have to do when you're talking about the uh, various uh, uh, sort of interactions that you have throughout the course of the day. I'm, I'm thinking of you uh, communicating with patients. I'm thinking of you communicating with uh, nurse and colleagues. And I'm picturing you communicating with uh, various doctors and, and, and other members of the health team. And there's all these uh, sort of power dynamics and and organizational <laughs> dynamics and um and and that each member of uh each of those groups have different um sort of knowledge bases and what they're looking it sounds like an incredibly sort of dynamic and challenging workplace um did you do you, can you recall a time where where you were sort of talking to one group the wrong way like you were sort of you hadn't you hadn't developed yet that ability to sort of f switch the filter yep. yeah yeah <laughs> uh yeah so it would have been probably actually probably a year ago before i took this job as an educator and just learning that new skill because now i'm like okay now i have to is i'm in a different role right so i'm in more of a leadership role right. like in like dealing with the ministry of health and all that so like if i say something the, like i did say something the wrong way i apologize you have to you have to go back on it yeah. but they were all understanding like sure. it happens tech unfortunately technology does help with it but right. it does also hinder it at the same time yeah and so just dealing with that and learning what I can and can't say or how I say it in a different way, especially if I want to direct something, it was a challenge for me at the beginning of my starting of my new role. But I did over time, time work with my program director and my program manager to figure out ways that I can communicate better to the staff members. Was that something that you spoke to as you sort of interviewed for increasingly, um, you know, progressive jobs? Uh, was the communication part of your skill set, did that come up in the interview process? Was that something that they were looking for when they were hiring? Um, it did come up in the interview process. And there, one of the things they liked about me is that I can communicate by sk with skills a lot because I did help do practical nursing placements at Grand River Hospital. So I was able to, with the students, talk to them about it, go um, precisely what they learned in the textbook to what they're seeing with the patients. Okay. But again, going from a bedside nurse to a leadership uh, role is a difficult, it's a difficult transition. Yeah. So dealing with that leadership and now with the writing and the actual communication part of it, like I had to change my whole, almost not my whole vocabulary. Oh my gosh, goodness. But I had to actually change some of the things that I would say right. to portray what I really wanted to say. Interesting. So you mean like sort of coming at it sideways a little bit, being a little bit more patient with the lesson to help the students or the... It was more playing the devil's advocate oh, okay. of seeing both sides. Like, oh, okay. yes, I can see your side on the right. side, but can you see it on this side? Or how how can I help you with things? Like, I had to be very open like that because right. some I was a person that everyone came to for complaints, even as as a bedside nurse. Right. So for me to actually say, okay, how can I help you with this? Or what can we learn from this? Or what do you want to see come out of this? Like that stuff, I had to learn how to say and how do I not portray. Um, the wrong communication to the staff member. How do I be open with the staff members? The stuff that I, I had to learn on my own, yeah. but with the help and guidance of like my program manager and director, they were really understanding about it. They gave us um, workshops with it so you can communicate well. And it was like a whole team, like the whole surgical team actually did do that workshop. And so we could communicate effectively with one another. It sounds like there is a real emphasis on ongoing professional learning in the healthcare space. And that is literally my whole job. Right. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so obviously the, these communication skills that might be part of a nursing students, uh, program, 
uh, or schedule in year one, year two uh, of their diploma or their degree, um, they would be wrong to think that, you know, get that off and, and I'm done with it, right? This is, this is something that they are going to be engaged with for the long haul. They, yes, if they haven't heard it yet, they're going to hear it soon. You have to do education for the rest of your life, right? To maintain your license, so they all they should all know that now. <laughs> okay, good to know. You, everybody got that. Uh, is is self reflection part of this process too, or, or is there the expectation that you're doing sort of uh, debriefing either on your own or as part of the group? Uh, that seems to me like it would be a, a kind of fertile ground. So there is a quality assurance that every um, nurse has to do to maintain their College of Nurses um, membership. So we go th- a yearly th- we go through a yearly process of how do we maintain our nursing license. So that's part of it. Um, debriefing and everything also can happen after critical events in, okay. the, in the in the hospital. So we do sit down and talk about them, especially something that is traumatic or something that we yeah. something that could happen. That's what we do have a debrief and self reflection about. As well as my, with one of my jobs is if anyone has that issue, they can self reflect or they can come to me and we can talk about it. I am a listening ear because I've been in those situations like them. So obviously, the uh, sort of technical aspect of of medicine changes rapidly. New technologies, uh, new new practices and protocols. What about the communication side of it? Do you see that? changing as technology changes too? Uh, you know, is, is, it, is it just that the, the way you record the charts and, uh, and, and communicate the patient information is, is changing? Or do you see uh, AI and chat GPT and the like starting to creep into your field too? Oh, 100%. I don't feel like I feel in a couple of years down, everything will be on computer or I don't even have to chart anything. It will be coming just straight from the patient to the computer just because how everything is right. with technology nowadays. Like I'm doing all my charting on a computer. I'm doing half the surgeries with technology. All that stuff is going to be applied. So I don't think there will be ever pen and paper within the hospital settings in a couple of years. Right. I think everything will be on computer. So what do you think that means for these skills that you have developed along the way? You still have to have those skills, especially yeah. with the patients. It's just the writing just the writing skills might change a little bit because right. you wouldn't have to display them. But we still there is still a lot of people who actually still do their own assignments in pen and paper, write down those little tidbits that we all forget about, even in nursing, no matter where you are in nursing. I see more of the patient information just going straight into the chart or I even see patient information, especially if they're a really sick patient, going straight to the physician. Yeah. Like the nurse will see it by going straight there to make sure the physician is aware of it, too, because we have to relay certain information to them. I see it just bypassing sometimes and going straight to them like an email on a phone saying, oh, hey, your patient has an elevated heart rate. Do you want to send orders to this nurse? Got it. Yeah, I can see that happening, too. And yet you'd still be kind of curating that information, right? You'd still be reading it in a way in this really kind of fast paced way trying to select the options from, you know, the the toolbox, let's say, you know, this process that means this means this and you're. And there's still some skills with the nursing that you actually have to physically do. So right. it's right. not all going to be. No, yeah. no. you so still have to have hands on on that patient. OK. And so for the for the, the students uh, who are in their their pre-health science or their practical nursing or their RPN right now, what are some things that that you would recommend they do in terms of how they approach their um, their their communications courses, their writing assignments. What should they do now to help them to progress to that kung fu moment where now they're making hundred PowerPoint slides, sort of you know on the fly? What what's the step that they should be taking now? Do you think? Um, asking questions. First off, like um, if you have an assignment, ask what specifically what the teacher was asking for. Okay. If you can't read the question and no understand it, that's a big thing. Yeah. You could think that they're asking for this item, but they're really looking for this. And a lot of the teachers will actually say, no, I'm really looking for this. Yeah. Uh, communication is more of a working bridge of it. Yeah. 
you can start off being a quiet person and then work your way up. I started off as a quiet person and now I'm here. So it's, it takes time. Yep. You can't rush it, nice. especially with the reading. You think you can read the entire textbook before the end of the semester? Yeah, forget it. Yeah. You want to focus on what you are learning and how you are learning and how you can interpret that learning so you can write those tests better or write that, um, oh my goodness, that essay better. Yeah. Or even communicate what you're learning because they do, the teachers do listen about that yeah. and see that you're making those connections with it. But it, it takes time. I think that's great advice, both the, the being patient part and realizing that, that this is a step in a journey uh, and, and that that one step must come before the next, before the next, um, and that you can't rush that, but that it is also taking you somewhere. And then also, uh, I love that other piece of your, your advice there, that idea that you need to be engaged with the sort of big picture part of the learning, that it's a, a two way street, that, that you have to have some, uh, engagement with what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it. So uh, realizing that you, even though it's an assignment being given you, that that you actually are in charge of that, that there's a lot of um, ownership that can happen when you ask questions, when you have a kind of back and forth with the professor or with the assignment itself, that it's a kind of back and forth process and that you kind of build up the meaning from there as opposed to just sort of check the box, did the thing, and now I'm done. Well, I, I'm so, so uh, happy that you came in and, and spoke to us today, Sarah. Uh, I, I think that the experiences and insights that you shared today uh, are really uh, useful to uh, younger people who are hoping to sort of follow in your footsteps. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for asking. And that marks the end of another episode of Reading and Writing Between the Lines a podcast hosted by me, John Witzman, on behalf of the Communications Department and School of Interdisciplinary Studies at Conestoga College. You can find other episodes of this series on our YouTube channel, Reading and Writing Between the Lines. Stay tuned for more episodes. Thanks for listening. <laughs>